Um, so wildlife gardening is not about just turning your entire garden over to wildlife and we don't expect you to do everything in this presentation. It's just thinking about what wildlife is currently in your garden and what wildlife species you may want to attract to your garden by making some small changes. Um, and we want to focus on gardens because they are a really important resource in uh, you know, our current landscape. Uh, we are losing a lot of natural habitats and gardens really provide stepping stones to different species to connect those habitats. And they also provide key resources like food and shelter. Um, and some species rely entirely on gardens uh, for those resources. Um, and again, it doesn't involve um, huge changes. We're talking about small little things and small actions, um, either for specific species or for wildlife in general. Um, and I'll go over these as, as, as we go into the presentation. Um, and it's not all about wildlife as well. It's about you and you can get lots of benefits from wildlife. Um, it's really good for mental well-being. So it's a great way to be mindful, um, taking a bit of quiet time to um, look at the different species, different butterflies that may be in your garden. Um, and you can tailor it to your gardening needs as well. So by gardening for wildlife, you can actually do things like improve uh, the flowers that are growing in your garden, you can um, grow bigger and better vegetables. So um, you can pick and choose what you do depending on what you want to get out of your garden. Um, and so for frog life, um, this presentation um, is, 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 you know, focus a little bit on reptiles and amphibians and specifically common toads, because we're doing this through the Yorkshire toad uh, project, which is Tales of Amphibian Discovery. Um, and it's about uh, trying to reverse and prevent some of the declines of our common toad. Um, it's because toads are in trouble. Um, they are undergoing population declines. We've lost uh, two thirds of our population in the last three decades. And that means that they could be extinct within uh, the next 10 years. And I think that's really sad because uh, toads play a really important role in our ecosystems, but also in our culture and our, our heritage as well. And there's a number of different reasons why we're losing toads. Uh, habitat loss as we build in our natural environments and as habitats uh, become degraded, uh, we're losing things like uh, ponds. We've lost uh, two thirds of our, our ponds in the last 10 years. Uh, road crossings are really um, really bad for, for, for toads having uh, that they're migratory. So they will go to their um, ancestral pond uh, that they were born in. And if there is a, uh, if there is a road in the way, um, they tend to travel at night when they can't be seen and they tend to travel when it's raining and they're quite slow moving. So they're run over. Uh, climate change also affects uh, reptiles and amphibians, um, specifically toads. Uh, more mild winters actually leads, lose, uh, leads them to lose body fat. Um, it also means that if there's um, you know, colder and harsher uh, periods of time or, or we're getting a frost uh, later into spring, that can affect um, their, their eggs. Uh, they're also affected by diseases, specifically, uh, particularly ranavirus. Um, um, and we can do lots of different things to help prevent these um, prevent these things from from affecting uh, toes. And there's lots of things that you can do in your gardens to help. Um, so I'm just going to start straight away with the best thing that you can do for wildlife, and that is to build a pond or to incorporate uh, water in some way, shape or form into your garden. And this isn't just for things like uh, amphibians. It's important for birds, hedgehogs, other wildlife species as well that you know require water as a resource. Um, and there's a number of different ways that you can incorporate um, water or build a pond. I'm going to show you some examples now. So here's um, some pictures of some ponds. Um, as hopefully you can see from the ticks or the crosses, some are better than others for different ways. Um, and it's important if you are thinking about building a pond or if you're thinking about improving a pond um, that you think about some key elements. So one of the most important things is to make sure that wildlife can actually access your pond. So there's no point having water there if things can't get to it to drink or things can't get to it to breed. So thinking about easy access in and out. So um, you can see in all of these, actually, all of these, there are ways that wildlife can get into a pond. So a great example is this um, uh, image on the top right. You can see there's a really nice shale beach there. There's some larger stones that allow smaller and larger 
um, animals to get into the water or go up to the water. And also there's some adorable little steps there um, for hedgehogs, for example, which may fall in. Um, I am aware that hedgehogs can be quite clumsy and um, they can drown in ponds. Uh, so that's a really good example of a pond that is accessible to wildlife. Um, and some of these ponds as well show another um, important thing, which is to have a shallow area or a gradient of the pond. And that's because different plants and different uh, insects, for example, will use different depths of the pond um, at different times of the year and for different things. So, for example, frogs may lay their eggs in shallower water where they're going to get a little bit more sun and then during the winter they may go dormant at the bottom of a pond. So by having a range of different depths um, in your pond you'll enable that to be beneficial to wildlife throughout the year. So again something like a shingle beach is a really good way of doing that. Uh, the best place to build your pond is in, um, in sun they need a lot of sun uh, for both the plants uh, that are there and also, you know, things like breeding, um, breeding insects, amphibians to keep the wa water a little bit warmer. Um, but they want, they do want a bit of shade as well. So you don't want your pond to overheat. So the best place to do it is is in sort of a full sun area, but then have some marginal plants around there or some leafier bushes to provide a little bit of shade or maybe an area where a fence will provide a bit of shade later on in the day as the sun moves around. What we don't recommend is that you put your pond under trees because leaf litter can go into the pond and um, really mess up the nutrients and the oxygen level um, and you know turn it into into something that, that's actually very beneficial for wildlife. If you do have a pond under trees we recommend that you uh, rake out the leaves. Now is a really good time to do it when you've you know all of the, the leaves have fallen off the tree so you're not going to be repeating it um, but most animals are dormant or have left. So it's important that when you do scrape out these leaves, you leave them on the side for anything that's still living in there. For example, dragonfly larvae, which take a number of years to hatch into dragonflies. Um, things can crawl back in and then you can uh, dispose of those leaves onto the compost heap. Don't leave them there because that will make nutrients leach back into the water. Um, Having a stable water level is also really important, but um, ponds will fluctuate in their water levels as the seasons go on. So in summer, you will have a lower water level. You can top it up. You don't want it to dry out completely. You can, if you've got a large, you know, a, a high water level or quite a large pond, you can use tap water um, as long as that's not going to be in the main bulk of the, of the pond. But if you're using if you're filling it up again from tap water, it's important that you treat it um, to remove the chlorine um, and you can get water treatment um, products from local garden centres. Um, and at the same time, thinking about the oxygen levels, we need to think about the plants. So there's a number of different plants that you can include, and that's all about regulating the oxygen level and also providing things like breeding opportunities. So um, newts will want to lay their eggs on uh, surface uh, plants, for example. And I'm going to share a resource with you, and it's, it's actually in the chat. Um, a resource called Just Add Water, and that has a great list of plants that are both marginal or within the water. So things like uh, flag irises and marsh marigolds and things like different pond weeds that will be beneficial to wildlife. Um, and on the same level, you know, you need a vegetated margin. So this, this pond here in the bottom left corner is a really good example of a pond that has a great vegetated margin because things like frogs and toads don't spend all of their time in ponds, they actually spend a lot of their time outside and in vegetation and we're keeping cool. And especially when frogs hatch, um, they will go into the marginal area of a pond to keep damp. Um, so if you don't have that vegetated margin, um, you're not providing that resource to, to wildlife. And, and it's really important as well that that vegetated margin covers up exposed liner. So this pond, the bottom right, is a really bad example of a wildlife pond. There's no Oxygenating plants, there's a really big exposed liner. The, the reason why liner is so bad is um, both insects and amphibians that crawl out uh, basically fry in the summer. Um, it doesn't provide them anywhere to hide or you know, provide them with any benefits. Um, so try and steer away from this pond in your bottom right and go for the one in the, uh, at the bottom left. But again, that resource that, that we've shared and, and we'll, we'll share again will really guide you in building a great wildlife pond. 
and it can be any size. We say about two meters by one meter is, is a really good optimal size of a pond, but you know, you can, you can even use a bucket um, for, for a pond as well, as long as you follow some of these tips as much as possible. And so the other thing that's obviously important in a garden is thinking about what you're gonna grow. Uh, so we need to think about the different plants that we could include to be beneficial to different species and where we're gonna plant them and when we're gonna plant them. So having something like a wild patch where we include different pollinating plants can be really beneficial, but you don't have to do that. Um, if in your lawn or in your beds, if you would like a neater garden or if you don't have much space, you can do that in pots and planters as well. And you can use this opportunity to grow food uh, for wildlife at different times of the year as well. So just a little bit more information on this. We, we advise that you think about native pollinator plants, um, both annuals and perennials. And we say native pollinators because these plants have evolved alongside our insects or our insects have evolved alongside these plants and the colours and the shapes and the sizes of these flowers um, have, have evolved in a way to um, attract the insects that were are most beneficial for them and the in insects get the most benefit from, from these plants. But it's not just about native pollinators. Uh, research has shown that having some non-native species is also really beneficial because these tropical plants tend to have a longer growing season. They tend to be more into the summer and the autumn, and they tend to um, provide then a greater and longer resource for wildlife um, across the year. So it's all about having a mix. So don't neglect your native pollinators, but don't think that these are the only plants that you can grow. Um, I really, I'm just picked up a few species here. I really like cornflowers. They just go forever. Um, just a wildflower mix. You can, you can pick these up even from your local pound shop. Um, and you'll be surprised by, by what will grow. Um, borage is a really good plant, scabious. I really like uh, verbena, um, benariensis. There's lots of different types. That is a, a, a really nice, attractive plant. It's a nice tall purple one, and that's really, really good for bees and butterflies. But there's loads of different uh, plants that you can grow. Um, if you are into growing vegetables, uh, then you can think about plants that will help you with that. So growing things like mint, as well as being um, a plant that will provide pollen for different insects, will attract uh, pests away from your carrots and uh, broccoli, for example, and garlic chives are really good as well. And they, they look quite attractive. Um, and then thinking about the plants that you can incorporate to provide uh, food for wildlife, so hedgerow brambles, that's a way of um, diversifying uh, your hedgerow to include um, autumn awesome fruits, uh, wild strawberries, strawberries you can dot around your garden, and things like sunflowers you can use as a hanging sort of little mini bird feeder uh, later into the autumn. Uh, so, so some um, ideas there, but there's loads of different sources, you know, RHS website has some great ideas. Um, we can also think about where we have these plants and, and I would really like to encourage you to think about having a little bit of a messy area of a border and I don't mean um, it being completely wild and looking terrible but you can incorporate things like some uh, grasses and if you just leave an area to see what will grow you'll be quite surprised by how attractive that can look um, and that's about providing a different range of heights of vegetation to enable um, different wildlife species to use that as refugia so things like um, uh, frogs and toads will will hide in long grass and use that to keep uh, to keep cool. You can also have some no mow areas. So um, I have a really nice little patch in my garden that I don't mow. Well, my garden isn't large enough to mow. I go around with some secateurs, but anyway, um, I have a little patch and it looks really pretty. You get all sorts of things growing there. I've got some really nice clovers. I've got buttercups and things like that. And it can look really attractive and it adds a little bit of a different dimension to your garden as well. And again, you know, those different uh, pollinating uh, plants will be really beneficial to different insects. And then you'll have that longer grass as well for things to hide in there. So some more tips, think about long grasses wildflowers to different areas if you are doing a bit of uh you know a bit of digging and you know you've you've got some soil that you don't know what to do with you can put it into a bank on a like a sunny spot incorporate some wildflowers and that'll be a really nice butterfly bank um wildflowers are really nice for you as well i bring in wildflowers um a, uh, across the spring and summer and by cutting them that makes them last longer as well so i have you know marigolds and cornflowers and um, cosmos that I bring into the house. 
Think about a variety of heights as well. So different insects will feed at different heights. Um, but if you are thinking about mowing or strumming, just be really careful about what's living there. So if you do, you know, have these long areas, you will attract wildlife. And then if you're not, not careful, you may damage that wildlife if, if you know, if you, you do go to strim it. So hedgehogs and frogs and toads are really susceptible to being injured by strimmers. So give it a little ruffle um, in long grass uh, just to sort of uh, disperse any wildlife that may be there. Um, and another way that you can incorporate long glasses is, is in your pond border. So um, I've got a little pond in my garden. It's tiny, but it's a little pond. And um, I just don't do any, any mowing or any, any maintenance of the, the border. And that has some nice long grass. And that, that, that's, my, that's my sort of marginal plant area for my pond. Um, I grow as much, uh, as much produce as I can in my garden. I'd be surprised by what you can grow in a small area. Um, and as, um, you know, as, as I grow things, I, I'm obviously thinking about the pests and um, particularly slugs and snails, which are the bane of my life. Um, and it's really tempting to get out the slug pellets and just hammer the slugs. But there are different ways that you can um, deal with pests without um, that being detrimental to other wildlife species through natural pest control. So I'm going to um, give some advice on slugs because I have tried this out myself. Um, I would say that the best thing that you can do for slugs and snails is to go out with a torch um, at night and do a good old fashioned slug hunt. Um, it's uh, quite rewarding. What you do with the slugs and snails after your slug hunt, I will leave up to you. Um, I take them for a little journey. Um, some people put them in the bin. Um, I'm not going to encourage you to, to, to you know, kill wildlife, but um, it's up to you. Um, one way that you can um, attract um, slugs and snails to the right places so you can actually collect them is by putting down something like a wet plant saucer or boards in your bed. And um, as the sun comes up, they will crawl under that to, you know, keep cool and moist. And then you can go and uh, pick them up and dispose of them. Uh, I have experimented with bramble, as you can see in the top left here. Uh, this is a snail that is finding it very difficult to crawl over the spiny parts of that bramble. That's actually been quite good uh, for when you've got like a, I've, I've used that around uh, beans and things where I've got like quite one, one stem that is quite easy to sort of put a border around. Um, the other thing as well is thinking about sacrificial plants and foods. And this is something that also works for uh, things like badgers. So think, you know, if you don't want badgers coming in your garden and, and digging it up, um, what you can do is actually put down things like peanuts. And what they'll do is they'll just come in, eat the food that's easy to get and then leave. And it's the same thing that you can do with slugs and snails. They'd much rather eat some nice lettuce on the floor that is easily accessible than crawl up your beans to devour those. Well, that's what I like to think anyway. Um, and I have had some success by actually feeding feeding the slugs. It does sound counterintuitive, but it does keep them away from um, your prize, uh, prize plants. Uh, what I'm not going to recommend that you do is put down beer traps um, because it may look like you're getting slugs and snails as you know, you, you look you know, at, at glee in these you know, five slugs that have you know, drowned in your beer trap, but actually uh, they can smell uh, the beer from several hundred yards away and for every five that you catch, you will attract another hundred from your neighbor's gardens and they won't make it to the beer, but they might make it to your lettuces. Uh, so that's not something that I'd recommend. Um, I'm not going to tell you to absolutely don't use slug pellets at all because sometimes uh, we get desperate, but please uh, steer away from um, things that aren't based on ferrous phosphate. So ferrous phosphate is basically an iron based um, pellet, which has been shown to not be uh, harmful in uh, small quantities to wildlife and pets. So if you use it sparingly and you only use it where you need to and try and corner off those areas from things like hedgehogs, then it is something that you can use without being too damaging for wildlife. Uh, you can also think about natural predators. So by attracting amphibians and birds to your garden, they will deal with your slugs and snails. Uh, blue tits, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact statistics, but blue tits eat an absolutely ridiculous amount of caterpillars every day. So if you are having a caterpillar problem, then by feeding the birds and you know, attracting, attracting birds to your garden or, may, or you know, thinking about um, providing hedgerows and things like that as, as um, 
as areas for blue tits to hide in and things, then then you know you'll you'll attract the, those those predators. Uh, nematodes are also things that you can buy from garden centres. These are little parasites of slugs and snails. You sort of sprinkle it on the ground and water it, and then they um, infect slugs and snails. I haven't actually had that much success with those, but I know some people who have. Uh, companion planting, you can incorporate marigolds uh, and nasturtiums. In the bottom left here, uh, you can see a really nice example where somebody's done that, and that will actually attract those pests away from um, those vegetables. And I have had some success in that way. I've grown nasturtiums, and I've been horrified by the amount of aphids that have been on there, but then I've had absolutely no aphids on anything else, so they've been really successful. Uh, in Spring and summer, we may think about how things are growing and think about pruning plants and hedges. This is just a quick tip that uh, we need to think carefully about nesting birds. It is illegal to disturb nesting birds and uh, nesting bird season is from March to August. So if you are doing uh, maintenance during that time, cutting down a tree, it's important that you um, look for what may be nesting there. And I would say that if there is a nesting bird, I would just leave it alone. Wait, monitor it and wait until they fledge um, and then deal with it. Um, and you do need to be checking up until the day before um, or the day that you do any work. Um, so yeah, yeah, just be aware of what may be living there and you know, try and try and you know keep basically on the right side of the, the law for that. Um, as we go into autumn and winter. Uh, we're thinking about what may be uh, living in our garden and what may be using it as a resource and how we can help those wildlife species get through this difficult time. So there are a number of things that we can incorporate into our garden um, and we can build things for wildlife um, for them to use as a refuge. So hedgehog houses are something that you can uh, build or you can buy from every, you know, everywhere selling hedgehog houses now. Um, you can build a book hotel um, and that will um, enable things like uh, um, solitary bees to uh, spend the winter um, in your garden. Um, something that I'd like to bring your attention to are log piles and hibernacular or, hi or hibernaculum. Um, it's a complicated word, but these are basically homes for reptiles and amphibians. And, but they'll be also be used by a range of different uh, invertebrates as well. Um, so hibernacular is basically a, a slightly posher way of saying a pile of uh, logs <laughs> that is uh, covered up. Um, so you can build this on top of the ground or below the ground. Um, if you want to build it uh, below the ground, you can dig an area that's about 30 to 60 centimetres deep. Um, you can remove that soil and put it to one side, fill that um, hole with different bits of rubble, um, some hardwood, uh, logs if you can, uh, pile it all up, but, but do it really loosely, leave some air gaps there. Um, and then when you've done that, put the soil back on top um, or cover it with turf or cover it with a bit, with a bit, of, um, a bit of carpet. And you can incorporate some um, uh, bits of drain pipe or make sure that there's some holes that they can get into. So in the top right here you can see an example of a high vernacular there. Um, if you've got if you haven't got well draining soil um, then what you can do is you can actually build that on top of the ground um, and just as a little pile and then cover it up with uh, soil. Um, again do it really loosely and you can actually plant on top of that as well. So you could plant some uh, wildflower well, plants, for example. Um, and this will provide a cool, uh, damp area that is frost free for reptiles and amphibians to spend out the winter, but also use in summer um, to get away from the heat. Uh, you can put a log pile anywhere in your garden if it's shady and if it's undisturbed, and uh, both reptiles and amphibians will use that. Um, a book hotel, this is a very, very posh very large book hotel at the bottom here that you can see using pallets. I love pallets. Uh, they're really useful in a garden. It's all about creating little nooks and crannies for different insects um, and different invertebrates uh, to use. Um, there's lots of different guys. I'm not going to share anything specific on that, but a quick Google about a book hotel will give you all sorts of resources on that. Um, other refugia that you can think about, upturned plant pots or metal sheeting. 
Here's a common lizard using a metal sheet to get some heat from the sun and it will go underneath um, when it gets a bit too hot. Uh, piles of undisturbed bricks are great for things like newts as well. So if you have a little bit of a messy garden and you, you, you know, if you have some piles of bricks and you're thinking, oh, I really need to move these, actually, they're being, you know, they're doing a great job for as providing a home for wildlife. So, you know, don't rush into, into tidying them up. Um, we can also think about uh, composting. Uh, if you do grow things and you manage your garden or you cut grass, you may have a compost heap. If you put it in a sunny south facing position, it will decompose well. I'd like to encourage you to use an open construction, again, using the humble pallet, uh, which is really good for being accessible to wildlife and allowing oxygen in there as well to enable the decomp decomposition process to um, you know, go on its uh, merry way. You can also put piles of leaves and grass as well if you don't have a compost heap. Uh, they may even be used by uh, grass snakes to lay eggs. They'll be used in the winter uh, by hedgehogs uh, to hibernate as well. Try and avoid those black sealed plastic bins because they're really not very beneficial to wildlife. Uh, things can't get in and, and things can't get out. Um, they can turn into a bit of a sludgy mess and um, you know th 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 there are better ways to do a compost heap. Um, if you do have a leaf pile or grass pile, again, just like a log pile, put it in a shady area and try not to disturb it. Um, it's good if you try and cover these things. Again, that provides somewhere else for, for wildlife to hide, but it also you know, keeps the heat in. Um, old carpet or tarpaulins or metal sheeting uh, will do a really good job of that. Um, I know um, on things like allotment sites, things like carpets aren't allowed. Um, so, so if you know you if you if you're using some of this advice to, to make your allotment or wildlife uh, friendly, just check with your society to make sure you don't incorporate some material that isn't allowed. We can also put up things like boxes and bird boxes. Um, autumn and winter is a really good time to be checking these things to make sure that they haven't got any uh, abandoned nests there or they're not being, they haven't been taken over, you know, by wasps. I mean, you know, wasps need to, wasps, wasps are creatures too they need somewhere to build their nests but you know if you want to keep them for the birds give them a little bit of a clean out in the autumn and winter and then they'll be nice and uh, available for birds as we go into the spring and you can also put bat boxes up as well and they'll, they'll use those um, throughout the year and um, as we go into autumn and winter we also may be thinking about how uh, we want to modify our garden we may be doing repairs uh, we may be doing some um, landscaping and that's all fine, um, but just be careful about what may be living under there. So things like newts and frogs and toads may be, uh, hibernating is not the right word because they don't, they don't exactly hibernate, but they go dormant, they go and rest um, and you know, slow down their body processes um, under things like flagstones, piles of bricks, old patios and things like that. Um, so if you do find something, it's not the end of the world, you're not bringing it out of hibernation, it's not gonna die, but um, try and either put it back from where you got it from if you're just moving some things around or try and put it somewhere in the same conditions. So if it's somewhere, if you're thinking about reptiles, uh, if you're thinking about amphibians, they're, they're trying to keep somewhere quite moist and quite a stable temperature and frost free. So um you know try if you've got another area in your garden another another you know pile of bricks or something like that try and put them put them somewhere like that uh we also need to think about how things move around our gardens so it's all very well having all of these resources available but if wildlife can't get into your garden and can't get out then it's not going to be very helpful um hedgehogs will move several kilometers um a night um, frogs will uh, and toads will move about 500 meters to a kilometer as they search for food and as they find go and look um, for a pond to breed. Um, so for a frog and a toad to get into your garden, it only needs a small gap of around five centimeters, but they may need to be, um, you know, you may need several of those because they're going to find it quite difficult finding one access point. Um, hedgehogs uh, tend to follow linear um, features in a garden. So you'll, you'll often see a hedgehog running along a fence. So uh, you will generally try to generally find a hole if it's there. It needs to be about 15 centimetres or about the size of a, a CD case. Um, and if you do um, put a fence gap in, you can map that on um, 
a, a website called Hedgehog Streets, where they are trying to understand how wildlife moves around our gardens. And that's a nice little citizen science project that you can get involved with. Um, feeding the birds is something that we all want to do year round. Um, but it's important that we think about the different types of food that we are feeding the birds at different types of year um, in line with their um, requirements. So in autumn and winter, we want to think about high fat foods that is going to allow them to build up their fat resources to enable them to survive food shortages if they can't find food when it's snowing, for example. So things like unsalted peanuts, fat balls, um, RSPB website and loads of different websites have some great recipes for fat balls. It's a really nice thing to do on a, you know, a horrible day with the kids. Um, so that's all about making sure birds can survive. Um, in spring and summer, it's important to think about not actually providing fatty foods. And these actually don't really last in warm weather. You know, you may see fat balls go a bit rancid um, in the heat. It's about providing proteins. So things like mealworms um, and sunflower seeds are the sort of things that you want to be feeding the birds um, because um, fat as well is a really bad thing for young birds. They need to be getting the protein that they need to uh, develop. Um, I mentioned citizen science before, but I just want to draw your attention to some citizen science projects that I think are really valuable. So uh, Garden Bird Watch is a really good one. The Big Butterfly Count is a really important uh, way that we are. It's not just thinking about butterflies, it's thinking about how different species are responding to climate change. So butterflies um, will change uh, their distributions. You know, we, we have, um, for example, in, in, in where I'm in Yorkshire, we had, have have um, uh, you know, woodland butterflies that um, were very rare that are now quite common because um, our climate is getting warmer, so they're able to migrate uh, further north. Um, and Frog Life has um, a citizen science project that I'd like to encourage you to all get involved with. And there is an app that we can use um, called Dragon Finder, and this is available um, on the various app stores for both Android and iPhone. And it's a way that you can identify, record and report the reptiles and amphibians that you are seeing in your garden. Um, on the left here, this is an absolutely not staged at all, completely natural photograph of a frog and a toad next to each other. Um, and you can see some of the differences between these uh, species, but um, next, to, next to each other, it, it's quite obvious. You know, you see your slightly more wartier frog and your more patterned toad with its longer legs and bigger eyes. But if you have something on its own, it can be quite difficult to identify it. So the Dragon Finder app will talk you through the different features and you can use a little, some little, you know, pointers to try and identify the species that you have got in front of you. Um, just a, um, a little word of caution is that the app includes um, species that are uh, nationwide. So Natterjack toads are not found across the country. Um, so just um, maybe have a look at the species pages which are um, on the app and just have a look about look at the distribution to help you identify whether you've identified the right uh, species or not. And once you've identified them, you can report them as well. And that helps Frog Life um, and other organisations um, think about things like climate change, how are different species, how reptiles and amphibians are responding to climate change. And it also helps us understand um, things about responses to diseases as well. Um, and um, we're, we're very interested in the spread of diseases and um, between, between amphibians and how, how we can prevent that. Uh, so some, some um, key uh, things that I need to just um, bring up, some questions that I get asked. Um, you may have some different questions to this, but some key things. A lot of people think that wildlife will damage um, gardens. You know, have people have badgers come in and dig things up. Um, but, if you follow some of the advice that I've given, um, wildlife is really beneficial. And if you're attracting things like pollinators, they will help you with your wildlife, they will with, with your garden. They will help pollinate your plants um, and give you more blooms. We're not thinking about attracting pests. Uh, we're thinking about attracting pest controllers. So actually your plants will do really well by following some of the advice in this presentation. 
Um, you also don't have to have loads of time. Um, lots of these things are one-off jobs, small changes. Um, they can be a really good family activity, making a book hotel, for example. Um, and I don't expect you to do everything in this presentation. Um, probably the most time consuming thing is building a pond. And if you can do that, that's absolutely fantastic. But you know, it's, it is, it is a one-off job. Uh, you don't need loads of space as well. So uh, if you don't have any space at all, I've got a tiny garden, but I've made, managed to attract loads of different wildlife species by thinking about hangers, companion planting doesn't take up any additional space. It will grow, you know, nasturtiums will grow among your, um, among your beans, for example. And again, a bucket pond um, is something that, 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 that you can do. It can be, it can be tiny and it will still be beneficial. I, I went to, uh, give a presentation on uh, an allotment and they had about four bucket ponds and they all had uh, frogs outside, uh, which was really good. Um, so it doesn't have to be massive. And your garden doesn't have to be messy either. So wild pots and plants is a, is, is a way to have a really neat display of different uh, plants. You can then remove them in winter or you can just have a little allocated corner as well for wildlife. So it doesn't have to take over your whole garden. Um, okay, so that's sort of everything I want to talk about, um, and I'd really like to um, encourage any questions now. I see there's some stuff in the in the chat. Um, I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen. There we go, um, and um, invite Dan to. I think he's going to moderate some uh, some questions and, and and try and help me um, uh, navigate the different questions. Hi, I've got loads of questions. Um, just a heads up as well. Um, a uh, thing on slugs. I've put loads of information about slugs um, or in the chat. Um, there is a wonderful Naturalist Live about slugs and how great and fantastic they are, although we appreciate they can be pests at times. Um, but be aware that if you are using slug pellets, you also wipe out um, other natural predators. Um, so things like beetles are massive slug um, and snail predators, and they don't really like it that much. There's also another fantastic Naturalist Live by um, Kelly Jowlett, who actually um, works at Rob Hampstead and she's looking at ground beetles being pest control and you can sort of bring them into um, your gardens just by having a bit of a rough area that they can go into and um, so yeah there's a lot there and um, so I've whacked some stuff in the chat and I'll probably ping some links to you guys as well and um, so yeah that's super so let's go um, so I've got a question from Lucy she's asking how way how far away from ponds do frogs actually go okay so this depends on the resources that you've that you've got and how good that pond is. So frogs tend to only go about 500 meters away from a pond um, and they'll stay, if you have all of the resources available in your garden, they won't need to really need to go anywhere. So um, you're, you're, if, if you've got um, some refugia, you may be, uh, you've in, included um, a log pile in your garden, um, they will only, you know, they'll probably travel to that and then come back to the pond in the, in the spring. Um, they will travel further if the pond is not suitable for breeding or if they need a different resource. Um, but it's generally around, around half a mile. They're not migratory like, like toads are. And I can see, but do they hibernate? Um, they, they don't hibernate, they go dormant. Um, so that what they'll be doing is they'll be looking for somewhere cool and damp to, um, to spend, the, spend the, uh, the, the winter, basically. Um, cool. Um, Lorna asks, um, when we're talking about confusing pests by using different um, plants and things, she's asking, um, should mint be planted next to the veg or do you have a recommended distance? Yeah, so so for companion planting, I recommend and, and things like mint, nasturtiums. I'd recommend that you plant those very near, very near to to the um, the plants. So I would um, sorry, I just have somebody at my door with a parcel who I've tried to go away about five times, but she's um, carrying on. Anyway, sorry about that. That's why I'm waving madly. Um, <laughs> with the mint, mint can be quite invasive in your garden and kind of take over. I would recommend that you put mint into a pot and put it next to um, next to your plants. Or what you can do is you can um, you can uh, put it into an, uh, you know into a bed, but then manage that every year. Um, but yes, companion plants. Try and keep them next to your next to your plants, and then and then those will draw those pests that you know are sneakily trying to get to your beans, for example. Um, they'll hopefully be attracted to that. 
Hopefully. Another great thing as well to add to that is um, things like Mint are actually um, resources for other um, very specific things. So there's the Mint Leaf Beetles, for example, um, that are very, very nice and very pretty. And if you don't mind them being there, um, they, they are spectacular to look at. They're very metallic and, and really cool. So, yeah, introducing more plants increases diversity as well. So an all round win. And if you've got some to put on your potatoes at the end of the end of the week, then, you know, everyone's winning. Great. Um, Lorna also asks, um, when is it okay to cut long grass? Um, do you have a recommended cutting schedule, for example? I mean, you know, it, it, if, you, if you need to cut your grass, I'm assuming it's going to be spring and summer. It's fine to cut grass. I would say a really nice thing to do would be to maybe have some areas on some rotation. So you can leave, if you can leave some areas uncut, that would be great. Or you could maybe have, you could maybe cut half of your lawn uh, one time and cut half of the lawn the next time. The, just the important thing to do is if you are cutting the lawn, uh, not not the not 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 necessarily the lawn because you can't do this, the, the really long grass is to just give it a little bit of a, a tussle, sort of like try and disturb things that may be in there. So there's a great example is um, earlier this year I went to my parents' house and they um, we were doing a little bit of uh, management um in the flower beds and we actually found a hedgehog curled up in some long grass which was absolutely adorable but we had no idea it was there and um so we ended up leaving that we, it wasn't necessary for us to for us to um cut the cut the grass um but if you've got a pond in your garden you'll get things like uh froglets um in the grass um and they'll just hide in there so if you sort of disturb it and ruffle it then they should hop away um and then you can cut it you know you you may have some casualties hopefully not um it hopefully won't be all of them you've got to rem remember that uh, frogs and toads lay so many um so much frog spawn and have so many young because they're just like turtles because there is a high mortality rate so um yeah hopefully there are more where they, where they came from but yeah um if you if you can leave a bit of grass great if you have to cut it in spring and summer it's absolutely fine just try and try and disturb what's already in there hopefully that answers your question i am um, i do something fairly similar um i've got a just a strip of grass that i leave at the side um another thing i would like to add as well is that when you do cut grass don't remove that resource from that area put it in a pile put it in a compost heap for example because you get amazing things i sieved my compost heap the other day and found over 60 species in it so you know it's it's a resource in itself and a lot of people they'll sweep up um leaves they put it in a plastic bag for some reason um and then remove it and actually there's probably quite a lot of nature in there so removing resources is also another thing that you need to take into account i guess as well um oh um we've got one let's go froglets um any advice on how to protect little froglets from domestic cats um is there any time of the day when it would be useful to shut in the cat cats okay <laughs> um cats cats are a, a difficult a difficult subject because um everybody you know Everybody has their opinions on whether cats should be inside or outside. I would say the best thing to do is just not have a cat, um, but you can't stop your neighbours from having cats. Um, cats will kill huge amounts of wildlife, all sorts of things. Um, I, it's very difficult because if you have an outdoor cat, um, they they will hunt when they can, they will hunt during the night and they will hunt during the day. So it's not really a case about when you can keep your cat in, it's whether you can keep it in, in, a, in at all. Bells are obviously something that you can do. I would, uh, if the best thing to do is if you can have a cat is monitor it when it's outside. Um, I don't actually think that there is, that there is much you can do to uh, prevent cats from uh, catching things unless you are monitoring them. Um, or keep or keeping them inside. It's a really sensitive topic, and I don't want to be telling people how to keep their pets. Um, I think that's sensible. <laughs> it's, it's a it's a hard one. Um, so are frogs more active yeah. in the night, or are they? Yeah, frogs tend well? to be. Frogs do tend to be tend to to go out at night more when when the weather is when when it's cool. So if you can have your cat in um, during the you know overnight then it's then it's not going to catch um things like frogs 
Um, but if it's out during the day, it may be more likely to catch birds which are foraging for their young. So it's, it's you know, by saving one species, you may be affecting an, an, another species. So cats are just they're just a difficult sub, they're just a difficult topic um, to to discuss, and they are they are difficult for wildlife. I would put a bell on your cat. I would keep them in during during uh, during during the night because they are more you saw nocturnal hunters. Um, if lions or anything, to, I used to I used to run a lion project, and uh, I used to spend my day watching sleeping lions. Um, who are you know very boring at boring during the day so yeah I'd, yeah let's say let's say keep them in at night <laughs> Cameron um Miller has put a note in the chat as well saying that keeping cats in at dawn and dusk is advised to protect bats as well so that's, there we are. that's great in a nutshell that's, thank you very much Cameron that's super um another emotive subject so feel free to answer how you feel appropriate um so someone's asking um they found a dead frog um but they also have in their garden they also have foxes is it likely that the fox is the cause of that or is it could it just be anything it could it could be anything so um again something that we're interested in um are uh diseases especially ranavirus um and on our website uh froglife.org you will um, which, which uh, I can, we can put some pointers to this. I think there are, there's the link above as well. We have some information on those diseases. So what will be really good is if it's not completely, uh, you know, desiccated already is to see if you can see any lesions on that, um, on, on that dead frog, um, which will give an indication of whether it's, it's been, um, affected by a disease. Um, if it's something that they can die from all sorts of things, and they can be caught by different uh, different uh, species. Um, even things like otters will eat frogs and toads. Badgers will eat frogs and toads. Uh, hedgehogs. Badgers tend to sort of um, skin them. Um, so without seeing it, it's difficult to know what has, what has, what has killed it. Um, I guess, I guess if, if they process. found it at its hole, then it hasn't been eaten as well. Which... Yeah, that is that is the key. That is the key thing. So yeah, I would I would say that you know there are natural predators of frogs and toads, and it is okay for things like foxes to. I, I, I'm not actually aware where the foxes where the foxes do eat frogs and toads. They may do. You know, they'll eat anything. Um, the most important thing is really identifying whether that frog has died due to a disease. So if you can do that, that will be really good. If not, I would just say let nature take its course. Um, frogs have to, uh, foxes have to eat as well. <laughs> exactly that. Um, and they, yeah, they, they've all evolved together, haven't they? And they've exactly. lived for, for millennia. Um, I've got a few questions about, um, in, like, encouraging wildlife like putting food out for hedgehogs and things like that but having issues with rats is there a way mm -hmm. that we can mitigate that it's just things like compost heaps that kind of stuff it's really difficult with rats i would say things like not putting out food for hedgehogs um like tin cat food and things that are smelly um hopefully that's going to deter rats and putting food high up unfortunately rats if if, if you're gonna make food accessible to a hedgehog or to a you know, to, to, to other species, you're probably going to be making it accessible to rats. I have kept chickens in the past, and that is something that I've really struggled with. So putting food out at certain times of the day and then removing it can be a really good way of uh, deterring, uh, or, you know, not providing that food for rats. So I, for my chickens, I used to put it out in the morning and I used to monitor it and then I used to put it and, and put it out in the evening and then they'd roam free and, you know, forage on everything else. Um, for things like hedgehogs, you could put some food down in um, uh, early evening and you could make sure that that's then cleared away in the morning so the smell's not there or even if you have an early visiting hedgehog you could um, remove it sort of slightly uh, later at night. Um, something that would be really nice to do um, if you're if you want to think about um, oh and this is also um, feeds on nicely to a comment I've just seen here from Lucy is there a way to tell if you've got hedgehogs if you don't see them I would 
uh, recommend that everybody tries a wildlife camera in their garden. I think it's an absolutely fantastic thing to do. You'll be amazed about what you see crawling around. Um, and it's a great way to see whether you've got hedgehogs or not. And these are available even from, even older used to do one. In fact, they used to do a fantastic uh, camera, which they don't do anymore, which I'm very sad about. Uh, you can get these secondhand. Um, they are very cheap on things like eBay. Uh, it's Christmas. So, you know, <laughs> great Christmas present. I am slightly obsessed with wildlife cameras because I used to do otter monitoring and that was the only way that I um, could actually, apart from going around finding otter poo, the only way that I could actually see otters uh, was through uh, wildlife cameras. And I've put them in my garden and you can even get to identify, uh, you know, different badges and things like that for badges visiting based on their facial markings. So that's a really good way to find out if you've got hedgehogs or you can look for hedgehog poo. Um, Google hedgehog poo. Um, I will describe it very briefly. Um, it's it's kind of, it's incredibly smelly, quite dark and about this long. Um, and uh, identifying, I'm sure FSC have got some great guides on how to identify wildlife scat. Uh, so that's another thing that you can do to identify the different species in your garden. Yes. Um, I mean, you will, get, you will get cats as well. I mean, I've had thousands of videos of cats, but there you go. Uh, Lucy's like, oh, is there any other way? The other way I can think of is finding a um, entry point, i.e. a hole at the bottom of a fence, and you can put a bit of sharp sand down or something similar, um, and then you can monitor that for footprints. Um, oh, yes, sorry. That's the other thing as well. A hedgehog tunnel. Yeah. Hedgehog footprint tunnel is fantastic. Very briefly make a little tunnel out of, and uh, if you go on Hedgehog Street's website or Wildlife Trust or Google Hedgehog Footprint Tunnel, there's, um, I, I did a little citizen science project on this. You can make it out of corrugated, corrugated sort of um, card or, or, or some, something like that. Um, and you basically uh, mix, uh, mix charcoal and uh, everything will walk over that and then you get your little footprints and it's a great it's a great thing to do to learn about different footprints as well. As if by magic it's appeared in the chat. So oh that's, that's amazing. Um, we've got two more questions. Um, so we've got one from Ruth asking um, she has a pond that has fish in it. Are the fish likely to eat the tadpoles? So they've, they've got midwife toads so they're a bit worried about that uh, and Bob is asking um, how effective is introducing frog spawn to a pond and would be recommended? Okay, so first on the fish, I would say that fish are probably the worst thing that you can do for your wildlife ponds, particularly things like goldfishy type carp things. They will eat everything and anything, and it's a great way to absolutely annihilate the biodiversity value of your pond. So if you're not sentimental about your fish, I would get rid. But what I would not do is um, rehome them in your nearest uh, river or lake because that will have an even worse effect on wildlife. Uh, so if you can maybe donate your fish to, uh, you know, someone who has got ornamental fish, that will be the best thing to do or just keep an eye on the numbers um, in, in a creative way. Um, so uh, fish will eat frog spawn. Um, if you've got a high pop, you know, a, if you've only got a few fish, I would say, you know, and obviously there are there are native fish species like sticklebacks, for example, uh, that will eat frog spawn. And the reason why frogs lay so much, so many eggs is because they expect them to be eaten. Um, but yeah, if you're noticing that you've got frog spawn one minute and none the next, I would I would put that down to your fish. Um, so yes, um, in terms of sharing frog spawn, um, it is. There's been some research done that has, that has linked the spread of viruses um, that affects uh, amphibians to uh, density of human populations. And the reason why we think that is, is because um, sharing uh, plants and sharing frog spawn is a great way to transmit diseases. So I would say, and also it's a great way to spread invasive species like invasive plants as well. So I would say that sharing frog spawn is something that we do not encourage. If it is your next door neighbor, I would say that that's probably okay. Um, it is, if it is somebody who is on the other side of the city, I would say it's not a good way. And the best way to get frog spawn in your garden is to, is, is to make sure that your pond is as wildlife friendly as possible. And if you're not getting frog spawn, it's probably down to a good reason. It's probably down to the fact that um, uh, frogs can't access it or it's not suitable. There's not enough 
resources in there or it's a new pond you know a lot of people uh you know want the pond to be populated straight away but it could take uh you know a, a year or two for a pond to be to start being populated by the right species um so if it's a new pond give it a little bit of time if not think about uh, you look at look at this guide that, we, that we've shared uh about uh just add, called just add water try and think of some ways you can improve it for wildlife if not then maybe it, it may just be that that frogs that your pond isn't suitable for frogs um and it's more important that we don't spread diseases um than we you know incorporate frog spawn and also there's a the danger that if your pond isn't suitable and frogs have chosen not to lay frog spawn in your pond you then introduce it it's probably not going to survive anyway so yeah that's my two pence worth on that <laughs> yeah unmute and say goodbye everyone thanks for joining thank you 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 th